Today's reading of Anne Frank's diary begins on page 24. Dear Kitty, today the Van Dons finally joined us in the annex. As soon as they entered the room, each carrying their most precious possession, I could tell what they would be like. Mr. Van Don, a spice expert who used to work in father's company. Mrs. Van Don looks like a diva, and their son Peter is afraid of his own shadow. If I must eat, die here, I might as well be sitting on my chamber pot. If I must die here, I shall have one more cup of fine Chinese tea. I have no plans to die here. There is so much to live for. I'm sure Edith, too, has her own personal hiding space. Page 25. The chamber pot was not the only thing that Madame Van Don kept hidden. Basically, everything considered a lady's essential made a disappearing act. I have been a lady all my life, and I plan to remain a lady no matter how bad things get. You won't believe the rumors being spread about your disappearance. Peter, come down immediately. First rumor, a German SS officer who served with Otto in World War I managed to smuggle you all across the Swiss border. Good afternoon. The bank will open soon. I assume you brought some Jewish money to deposit. Page 26. Second rumor, the Franks took off for a long vacation in the countryside. Third rumor, a neighbor swears she saw you being loaded into some kind of military vehicle in the middle of the night. Why did you have to mention that, you evil man? Oh, Anne, don't overreact. He was just making a joke. A joke? What sort of joke is that? Peter, come to dinner immediately. But Peter never comes down. He's always dying from some horrible disease. Oh, I'm dying. I have throat cancer. Dear God, my lumbago is killing me. I'm having a heart attack. I'm dying. Holy Moses, my kidneys are failing. So why Peter was dying in his room, obviously it was me who became the center of attention. Edith, I wonder how you managed to raise two completely different personalities, Anne and Margot, in the same house. Mind you, ladies, I'm in the room. I wonder why you didn't wear your fur coat today. It's pretty chilly outside, isn't it? If only you would learn some manners from your sister. Page 28. It's always about me and my sister. Page 29. Leave her alone. She's just a child. This depressing little girl will turn our life here into a nightmare. Please try to be gentler with her. Think of how afraid she must be. Anne, please come out. No one is angry at you. We must ask me up to bring some more sedatives. Medicine won't help. It's all about discipline. Look what a beautiful dress I bought for Anne. That's nice. She's been so sad lately. Page 30. Monday, September 21st, 1942. Dear Kitty, since the Van Downs' arrival, we have had a regular daily routine. In the mornings, while the workers are busy downstairs, we must remain deadly quiet. That is when we study and learn things by heart. This speech bubble written in French says, I am hungry, you are hungry, he is hungry, she is hungry, they are hungry. I am perfect, you are perfect, he is perfect, she is perfect. Peter thinks, I am dead, you are dead, he is dead, she is dead, we are all dead. At 12.30 p.m., the warehouse men go home for lunch, and the whole gang breathes a sigh of relief. Bep and Miep from the office bring us food, but we must eat in complete silence. So what is it now? Cabbage again? I mean, those who can be silent for three minutes straight. Page 31. At 5.30 p.m., all the workers finish for the day, and that signals the beginning of our nightly freedom. 
First, it's time for a bath, but we only have one tin tub to share. The water is boiling hot. I'm dying. Obviously, Madame Van Don hasn't decided where to take her bath. Why must you insist on carrying that upstairs? Can't you bathe in the office like everyone else? Have you seen me naked lately? So, she hasn't taken one yet. Father washes in a private office, which is as close to he could, as he can get to running the company again. Let's just say Mother takes her bath in a well-protected environment. Bath time with Margot in the office is a magical hour where I get to peek at the outside world. Page 32. It's time for dinner. Princess Juliana is expecting a baby in January. Oh, this is so boring. Boring? It's the most exciting news I've heard since we came here. At night, the bad thoughts creep into my mind. Page 33. Take this. It will help you sleep. I love you so much, Dad. I wish I could feel the same about Mother. I don't care if Mother dies. In Hebrew, this speech bubble says she will be sacrificed. Sorry, she will be sanctified or set free by the Lord. Page 34. Dearest Kitty, Monday, September 28th, 1942. Dearest Kitty, I'm dying to tell you about another one of our clashes, but before I do, I'd like to say this. I think it's odd that grown-ups quarrel so easily and so often and about such petty matters. Up until now, I always thought bickering was just something children did and that they outgrew it. Of course, there's sometimes a reason to have a real quarrel, but the verbal exchange that takes place here are just plain bickering. They refer to these as discussions instead of quarrels, but Germans don't know the difference. They criticize everything, and I mean everything, about me. My behavior, my personality, my manners, every inch of me. My behavior, sorry, um, every inch of me from head to toe and back again. Is the subject of gossip and debate. Harsh words and shouts are constantly being flung at my head, though I'm absolutely not used to it. According to the powers that be, I'm supposed to grin and bear it, but I can't. I have no intention of taking their insults lying down. I'll show them that Anne Frank wasn't born yesterday. They'll sit up and take notice and keep their big mouths shut when I make them see that they ought to attend to their own manners instead of mine. How dare they behave like that? It's simply barbaric. But enough of that. I bored you long enough with my quarrels, and yet I can't resist adding a highly interesting dinner conversation. Somehow we landed on the subject of Pym's extreme diffidence. His modesty is a well-known fact, which even the stupidest person wouldn't dream of questioning. All of a sudden, Mrs. Van Don, who feels the need to bring herself into every conversation, remarked, I'm very modest in retiring, too. So much so. So, so much more so than my husband. Have you heard anything so ridiculous? This sentence clearly illustrates that she's not exactly what you'd call modest. Mr. Van Don, who felt obliged to explain the much more so than my husband, answered calmly, I have no desire to be modest in retiring. In my experience, you get a lot further by being pushy. And turning to me, he added, don't be modest in retiring, Anne. It will get you nowhere. Mother agreed completely with this viewpoint. But as usual, Mrs. Van Don had to add her two cents. This time, however, instead of addressing me directly, she turned to my parents and said, you must have had a strange outlook on life to be able to say that to Anne. Things were different when I was growing up though they probably haven't changed much since then, except in your modern household. This was a direct hit at Mother's modern child-rearing methods, which she defended on many occasions. Mrs. Van Don was so upset her face turned bright red. People who flush easily become even more agitated when they feel themselves getting hot under the collar, and they quickly lose to their opponents. If I could draw, I'd like to have sketched her as she was then. She struck me as so comical, that silly little scatterbrain, I've learned one thing. If you only really get to know a person after a fight, I've learned one thing. You only really get to know a person after a fight. Only then can you judge their true character. Yours, Anne. Page 36. 
Saturday, October 3rd to Wednesday, October 7th, 1942. Dearest Kitty, I've been allowed to read more grown-up books lately. Eva's Youth by Nico Van Schutlin is currently keeping me busy. Eva thought that children grew on trees like apples. She thought cats laid eggs and hatched them like chickens. Eva wanted a baby, too. She took a woolen scarf and spread it on the ground so that the egg could fall into it. She squatted down and began to push. She clucked as she waited, but no egg came out, only something smelly that looked like a sausage. Eventually, Eva grew up and realized that women don't lay eggs. Page 37. Imagine that. I've, I imagine that I've gone to Switzerland. Daddy and I sleep in one room in my father's family's huge mansion in the Alps. Here, darling, 150 guilders. Buy yourself whatever you need. Oh, Daddy, you're so sweet. I'll buy all the essentials for my stay in the annex. That sort of daydream with so many details is what happens when you're in hiding for an unknown period of time. Page 38. Friday, October 9th, 1942. Today, Miep told us some terrible news from the real world. She saw her Jewish neighbor taken away by the Gestapo, and she could do nothing to help her. Later, she met someone who had managed to escape from a concentration camp. When Miep asked about her neighbor, the man said she'd probably been transported to Westerbork in a cattle car. Page 39. It must be terrible in Westerbork. The people get almost nothing to eat, much less to drink, as water is available only one hour a day, and there's only one lavatory and sink for several thousand people. We assume that most of the people in the faraway camps are being murdered. The English radio says that they're being gassed. Perhaps that's the quickest way to die. Page 40, Monday, November 9th, 1942. Dear Kitty, yesterday was Peter's birthday. At 8 a.m. sharp, I was already in his attic. So what presents did you get? I didn't know you smoked. Sometimes I do. It makes me look distinguished. In honor of Peter's birthday, we had news that the English had landed in Tunis, Algiers, and Casablanca. As Churchill says, this is not the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Yet another reason for optimism on Peter's birthday, the Russian city of Stalingrad still hasn't fallen into Germans' hands. And that is where we will stop for today. Until next time.